Something you need to know about me, that was a very brief CV. You might have seen me on The New Inventors. I'm a regular panelist on that show. But I spent the first 10 years of my career as a network engineer. For those of you who are people who know about data networks, I started off doing X25 packet assembler disassemblers. Then I wrote firmware for CSU DSUs for DS0 and DS1 equipment. <coughs> And I worked on Apple Talk and dial in Apple Talk networks, and then I started working on IP routers. So basically, as the network advanced from 83 to 93, I was advancing with it. After 93, I decided, well, the network is done, it's all going to be IP, whatever, let's move on. And I then invented a technology that put 3D together with the web, World Wide Web, something called VRML, which I then gave away as open source software still somewhat widely used, never really as big as it was going to be, probably because it was about 10 years ahead of its time. But that got me into teaching animators and then into teaching film schools, and I started the new media program at USC Cinema School, and then started the new media program at the Australian Film Television and Radio School, which is one on that track. So I wanted to give you all of that brief CV because I'm going to say things that are going to make you think that this man is nuts and he does not know what he's talking about. I want to assure you that, in fact, yes, I do. <laughs> So, talk today is understanding Gilmore's law, or how I quit loving, uh, how I quit worrying, and learned to be a commodity, which of course is the evil word. But I want you, over the course of this talk today, to embrace your commodityness. And I also want to show you that you don't have a whole lot of choice. Now, let's start off for the basic definition of Gilmore's Law. Gilmore's Law is fairly well known in certain corners of internet culture. It was coined by John Gilmore, a friend of mine, very well known, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, back in the mid-1990s. The net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. All right, it seemed like a very strong statement at the time. People went, oh, that's very interesting. It's very utopian. How nice for you to think this. Well, this week, the Vice Minister of Information in China was recorded as saying, it, is, it has been repeatedly proved that information blocking is like walking into a dead end. China is a one-party state. They have, as we know, the Great Firewall of China. They license every ISP in China so that all traffic is directed through that firewall. And despite every one of these precautions, key, things keep on leaking through. People find ways around it. All of the information that people want, it's out there one way or another. So, if China can't do it, how can any organization on the planet actually hope to try to restrict the flow of information? And of course, in the West, we're democratic, we giggle, of course, we would never try to staunch the flow of information. Well, Gilmore's Law doesn't just apply to politics. It talks about censorship. Censorship means the willful blocking of any information for any reason. And in the West, we tend to do that most for economic reasons. Most recently, lest we all forget what the entire world was consumed with on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. when Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows was released. And I'm three quarters of the way through the book, so shh, if you've all finished it. My sister has. She's trying to leak the secrets to me in emails. <laughs> I'm sitting in another conference on Wednesday morning, and I find out that, in fact, some young kid has gone and gotten a copy, photographed every single page of it, put it together into a PDF file, and uploaded it to the Pirate Bay. And there's the BitTorrent file to Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows. Now, the funny thing about this is they interviewed the head of Bloomsbury, who's the publisher in the UK and Australia, for this, and he said, you know, I actually reckon this is probably going to increase sales of the book because it's going to be out there, and people are going to now be under pressure to read it even more quickly. So that's an interesting condition because as much as Bloomsbury spent $20 million, big news, securing the book, making sure that a copy didn't get out there, all it took was one copy in one person's hands, and then because of the global networks, it was distributed very widely. And in the end, that distribution may actually have increased sales. And of course, the sales figures are out today. They're much higher than anyone had thought. Now, these two data points, China and Harry Potter, they show you the reach of Gilmore's Law. It's not about politics, it's not about economics, it's about blocking access to information. And in the same way, politics, economics, that's the story of broadband in Australia. Is it a political issue? Is it an economic issue? Oh, wait, 
It's a political issue and an economic issue. You know, why is that? Well, Telstra. Telstra is Janus-faced. It still has this body memory as being part of the government, as being a federal organization. And even now, it's been so long, it still reacts institutionally with a lot of the responses it had when it was part of the government. And yet, at the same time, it's also got a responsibility to shareholders, and so it has to react as if it were an economic entity. And it's sort of caught in this middle. But at the same time, Telstra still believes it has a political mandate to a lot of what it's doing. And it uses its economic strength to back that up. Now, that behavior has consequences. Because Telstra has engendered enormous resentment from a lot of people. Now, I wrote a piece for The Age, which maybe some of you have read, called Why We All Hate Telstra. I wrote that on an airplane between Hungary and California. Finished it off, mailed it off, didn't really think too much about it other than, oh, this is cute, it's fun, it's easy to toss off. I have never gotten a response like that to a piece I've written for The Age, and I've been writing for The Age for two years. And my editors at The Age said they've never gotten a response like that. We hit a nerve. Even if I was taking, and I wouldn't say cheap shots, easy shots, there, there's a nerve there. And it's not really just, oh, it's the phone company, let's hate it. No, it's that you folks are throwing your weight around, and you have to be very careful about that. And the problem is that every time you do that, you actually end up boxing yourself in. So you end up actually sowing the seeds of a consumer revolt. And what I'm going to do now is talk about what that consumer revolt actually looks like. And the problem is, this is not something that you can remedy in economic terms, and it's not something you can remedy in political terms, because the kind of revolt you're facing is not going to have a face that you have any hands to touch. It may actually just require you to rethink your business.